So welcome everyone to lecture two of uh, introduction to quantum optics. Uh, in the previous lecture, which was a very short one, it was only 30 minutes, uh, we simply reviewed uh, quantum mechanics with pure states, which is essentially the way in which you have seen quantum mechanics, hopefully, all of you. Uh, and today, uh, which is a much longer lecture, so it's, it will be about two hours and a half lecture, uh, the plan is that we will finally dive into the physics of quantum optics and in particular it will be today the day that you will see the quantization of the electromagnetic field for the first time uh, probably for the first time for most of you the idea will be as you will see that uh, we will essentially connect the electromagnetic field to some kind of mechanical model and once we know a mechanical model we have the laws of quantum mechanics as i presented them uh, one week ago that allow us to quantize mechanical models and so on and then this will allow us to quantize the electromagnetic field um, so this is the plan for today essentially we will we will go through this but before i want to uh, talk about one more point of basic quantum mechanics that i'm not sure that everyone is very familiar with uh, which is the following so we will need it for the rest of the lectures many times so then i will introduce it it's something about quantum mechanics that relates to um, a composite systems so what's composite system so by a composite system i mean the following so imagine that i give you a system okay so this is the system that uh, is described by some hilbert space h but now i tell you that actually this system is composed of two subsystems so let's say that is broken in two and we have system a with hilbert space a and system b with hilbert space b so now the question is uh, imagine that um, maybe a and b were two systems that you knew in advance and they were non-interacting but then suddenly you put them in contact and they start interacting and form a larger system h uh, so this means that you knew the hilbert space a and you knew the hilbert space b now the question is can we build the Hilbert space of the whole system, so H, based on the knowledge of Hilbert spaces A and B? Well, the answer is yes. Quantum mechanics uh, offers one uh, law, one postulate, if you want, that says that the Hilbert space of the whole system is nothing but the tensor product of the Hilbert spaces of the subsystems okay this is essentially the rule that i want to to tell you about and because i'm not sure if everyone is very familiar with tensor products i'm pretty sure that all of you are pretty familiar even if you haven't seen it uh precisely as a tensor product because all of you have deal with have dealt with composite systems one way or another but just in case you are not familiar let me just explain you what, what or the main the main properties of the tensor product so the tensor product it's a map so let me call it tensor product map so it's a map and in particular it's a map that establishes a unique correspondence between pairs of vectors in which one vector is contained in Hilbert space A and another vector is contained in Hilbert space B. So it's a correspondence between pairs of A and B vectors. Uh, and vectors in a larger Hilbert space H which we will always denote so these vectors this correspondence so the vector corresponding to psi a psi b we will always denote it by psi a 
tensor psi b. So take it as a symbolic notation if you want, or sometimes just to make things more compact and uh, shorten the notation, we will uh, simply write it like this, psi a, psi b. Okay, so then we have a correspondence between the vector spaces of the corresponding Hilbert spaces, and it's unique. So each pair of vectors in A, B is corresponding to uniquely to one vector in H. And we also establish a correspondence between inner products. So the inner product uh, defined on H. Yeah, sorry. So the inner product on H, we define it in the following way. So if we have two vectors, psi and phi, um, of the Hilbert space H, of the total Hilbert space, then the tensor, sorry, the inner product, um, I think you lost the iPad, right? Okay, you have it back, right? So can everyone say if you see the iPad now? Okay. Let me just try to make more space. Okay. Yeah, sorry for that. So I was saying, that uh, if we have two vectors, psi and phi, uh, in the so psi and phi uh, corresponding to the total Hilbert space, then the inner product between these two vectors, which of course can be written as the tensor product or correspond to two vectors, psi a and psi b, it's essentially the multiplication of the inner products of the uh, corresponding vectors in the corresponding Hilbert spaces. So let me make a bit more space. Okay. So essentially these two uh, properties are what defines a tensor product. Uh, you have a um, a more precise definition in the lecture notes uh, in the appendix uh, about algebra. But these are the two essential properties that you need to know about the tensor product. It's a unique correspondence between pairs of vectors A, B onto a larger Hilbert space and a correspondence between the inner product in the larger Hilbert space and the product of inner products in the smaller uh, in the subsystems. Um, then uh, there are a couple of things that are also interesting for you to know. So the first one uh, relates to the basis. So one special correspondence is between uh, how to build a basis in H. If we know the basis in Hilbert spaces A and B, and the idea is very simple. So we just take the fact that to each basis, each pair of basis vectors A, B corresponds a unique uh, vector in the Hilbert space H. And that unique vector, so for example, uh, if we know the basis in A uh, and we know the basis in B, we just make the tensor product between them and that will be a vector in H. And then that, uh, that set of vectors, that set of vectors will be a basis of B, okay? So again, this is a basis in A, this is a basis in B. And now this is very interesting also because it allows us to see that actually the dimension of the total Hilbert space, so D, the dimension of H, it's nothing, you just have to count elements. How many basis vectors are there? So we have 
dA times dB, dA basis vectors of A that you can pair with dA, sorry, dB vectors in B. Okay, so the dimension of the total Hilbert space is always the multiplication of the dimensions of each subsystem. Uh, and then finally, I also want to talk about uh, operators. So we can define operators in the total Hilbert space. So for example, an operator L just as the tensor product, again, of operators in the corresponding subspace, LA, LB. What does this mean? So it means what naturally uh, comes to your mind which is that essentially <clears throat> the, this operator L, when we uh, make it act onto a vector psi of the total Hilbert space, so again, this kind of vector in here, it uh, acts in the following way. It just, it just makes a correspondence between the vectors LA acting on psi a tensor l b acting on psi d okay so essentially this is how we define operators and sometimes we will use a shorthand notation similar to this notation here for the vectors uh, for the operators when it is clear on which subspace they act for example, because they have labels like in this one, like I have written. So here we have LA. So we know that this operator is not defined on the B space and is not defined on the general space, is defined on the A space. So when this is clear, then we just omit the tensor product and we just make LA act on psi and LB and act on psi and we understand what that means. They act on the corresponding subspaces. Uh, sorry, okay. I, have, I have a question regarding to this. Yes, please. Uh, uh, you are talking about pure state, yes. So the if yes. you if the state is um, not a pure state, it's an entangled state. What's your definition for psi a and psi b? Ah, that's that's very interesting because the next slide is about entangled states. Okay. So uh -huh. yes, but it's it's the same. It's exactly the same as as we will see during the course. But you can imagine that uh, if you just have a sum of many terms like this one, so imagine that instead of just psi A tensor psi B, you have a sum of many of these kind of elements, okay? Okay. Now, this is also a vector in the total Hilbert space, okay? Perfectly allowed by quantum mechanics. And you can use this, uh, you can use these laws exactly in the same way. In particular, for example, if you have this operator L A L B acting on many of on sums of these kind of terms, you just keep the same sum, but with each operator acting on each of the vectors of the sum. So we will see. I think we will see during the course many examples in which you will you will find how to do this, but. Um, but perhaps I can give you a very, very quick example. So imagine that your state is something like this. So it's psi A times psi B plus phi A times phi B. So I guess that this is what you mean, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. So then if we want to do things with this, uh, with this state in here. It's very easy because, for example, if you want to calculate the norm of this state, okay? So would you know how to calculate the norm? Of course you would know because let's, let's make something. So let's call this state here. Let's call it, um, so maybe I don't want to mix too much the notation, but let's call this state here phi and this whole state here we call it phi prime okay so then just by the loss of uh, of the inner product you know that you just have to make this kind of composition here oh yeah i see 
the key idea okay. is that the inner product and the operator are linear operator. So exactly. That, yeah. So once once you have defined the inner product and everything for only one structure, then you just have to follow the linearity of quantum mechanics and so on. So is this clear? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Okay, okay. In any case, hopefully we will we will see many examples of entangled states and and these kind of systems. So we will and I will give you an exercise about this kind of thing as well. So you will get familiar with it. Okay, and precisely now I want to talk uh, about something that happens in uh, composite systems, a very special property of quantum mechanics, uh, that it's something called entanglement. So I don't know how many of you have already seen uh, what entanglement is. Uh, we will learn a lot more about it during the course because we will see some examples of how to generate this kind of states and so on. But let me just very briefly uh, uh, kind of give you a hint of what these states are. So entanglement uh, refers to correlations But correlations are nothing so amazing. It's something that appears in, in classical physics as well. However, entanglement refers to some type of correlations that are purely quantum. Okay, purely quantum correlations. This means that these are correlations that cannot appear in classical physics. This is called non-classical correlations. And let me just explain you how is it possible that we can generate correlations in quantum mechanics that cannot appear in classical physics. So, and I will do it just with a very simple example. So let me give you, let me give you the following state. So imagine that I have a composite system and that the composite system is in the following state. So the whole system is in the following state. So let me write it down. So imagine that we have two systems A and B. They, so we created some kind of states on them, but then after the creation of the states, they are not interacting anymore, okay? So you just have the two systems non-interacting such that you can define a Hamiltonian on each of the subsystems and you can define an energy spectrum for each of the subsystems and these states that I write in here so when I write E1 it really means I, I get energy one for system A and this one imagine that is a copy of the same system so they are two identical systems then this one in here is energy one for uh, system B but now what I do is that I don't have them both in energy one, but I have this funny superposition here. Okay. In which I create a superposition of energy eigenstates. So again, all these things are energy eigenstates. Okay, this is a state that it's allowed by the laws of quantum mechanics. So once we have this kind of state, now let me ask you a couple of questions. So the first question would be the following. So imagine that we perform, imagine that we perform a measurement. So we are going to measure. a Hamiltonian A. Okay, so we have two subsystems. We focus on one subsystem A and we measure the energy. So we measure the energy of subsystem A. So can anyone tell me as an experimentalist, what do you expect? So what do you think will happen? What will be the outcome of the experiment? Mm -hmm. Come on, don't be shy, open your microphone and answer. So do you think we will get which energy or which probability distribution over energies? 
one half e1 and one half e2 exactly very good so the idea is that for example with 50 percent probability okay we get the energy e1 which means that with 50 percent probability the state will collapse to e1 tensor e2 because we have two possibilities okay the superposition of two possibilities and after the measurement we found out one of them e1 which means by the postulates of quantum mechanics that we have collapsed onto this part of the superposition Okay, uh, sorry, one, okay. So both, now we know that both systems are in energy one, but this is very interesting because now, now we can predict, we can predict what will happen when we measure HB. So if I ask you, what is the outcome that will appear when we measure the Hamiltonian or the energy of system B, you will be able to predict it with certainty. So you know for sure that if after measuring, measuring A, you have found E1, now if you measure B, you will know, so you will find E1 with 100% probability. This, in other words, it means that system B and system A are correlated, okay? However, they are correlated, but they are correlated in a very special way because the correlations, the correlations are encoded in a superposition. Okay, and if you remember, the superposition principle is essentially the main or one of the main differences between classical physics and quantum mechanics. In classical physics, we cannot generate superpositions and therefore any correlations that we encode into superpositions, okay, like this one that I have written here, they must be necessarily non-classical. Okay, so you cannot, you cannot possibly reproduce quantum correlations encoded in superpositions, so entanglement, you cannot reproduce them with classical systems. Um, so this is very interesting. And as I said, we will see more about it during the course. And especially if you like it, some people can do uh, the project of the course about entanglement and so on. And this is not just a, a let's say a theoretically interesting thing it also has a very important number of applications so let me just tell you very quickly about them so i'm sure that you have heard about them many times but just to let you know that it has applications to something that we call nowadays uh, quantum technologies So in particular, if we know now how to create correlations that go beyond what can be done classically, we can exploit these correlations for technologies such as quantum computing or quantum communication. So secure quantum communication in which China is uh, the leading country essentially and quantum sensing, all these all this, uh, all this quantum technologies uh, are based or roughly based in superposition principle and especially on entanglement. And another very, very important thing is that these kind of states have allowed us to prove, this really is amazing. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful results of the century, I, I think. Um, it has allowed us to prove that quantum theory, and in particular, the probabilistic character of quantum theory, it cannot be described by some more fundamental deterministic theory 
that doesn't violate causality, okay? So this is very interesting because it is telling you that the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics, it's really a property of the universe, a property of the world. We cannot create a deterministic theory that it's compatible with quantum mechanics. And uh, well, unless we are willing to give up causality, which I think no one is willing to give up causality. So let me just write it down in particular. What we have been able to show with these quantum states, so these entangled states, is that quantum theory is different. So it cannot, uh, it's, it's not uh, explainable with a deterministic theory. So a more fundamental deterministic theory that we still haven't found, plus causality. So if we want to preserve causality, then we need necessarily uncertainties and uh, all this uh, probabilistic character of quantum theory. So this probabilistic character is not fruit of our uh, ignorance as humans, it's really a property of nature. So this has been tested and quantum theory has always won. So we have tested quantum theory against deterministic causal theories. And uh, we have always found that quantum theory is the right one. And this is something that you might have heard of. It's called Bell's theorem. Okay. And just very recently, just a, a, a few years ago, I think already maybe four years or something like that, maybe five years, it, it was proven, uh, it was finally settled that Bell's theorem is correct or that quantum theory is the correct, uh, the correct theory for the world. Okay, so essentially these are the two main applications I wanted to tell you about. I hope that it made you interested about uh, entanglement and this way, this, this interesting aspect of composite systems. And uh, if you don't have any questions, please, if you have, just, uh, just open your mic and let me know. But if you don't have any questions, then we will move on to uh, quantum optics and to the quantization of the electromagnetic field. Okay. So I don't seem to see any questions. Of course, you can ask me anytime later, also uh, privately, if you are interested and some other question that pops in your head. But for now, let's, <clears throat> let's start with the quantization of the electromagnetic field. And in particular, um, uh, as I said, we will do a correspondence between the electromagnetic field in a mechanical model. And in particular, um, we will start doing this correspondence in the classical world. So the first thing I want to discuss is I want to remind you a little bit about how we describe light and the electromagnetic field uh, in, in classical physics. And this is something that probably you all know, but it will be nice to set the, the stage. So essentially we all know that the electromagnetic field is described by Maxwell equations. And in particular, I will here write Maxwell equations in empty space. So empty space meaning that there are no charges or so free charges or free currents. And uh, let me denote the electric field by E. So it's a vector field with three components that depends on all the space-time coordinates, coordinates. And this is what we will call the electric field. And then I will call the magnetic field, I will call it B again with three components. Okay, so with this notation, Maxwell equations look like the following. So we have two equations. So the first one is that the divergence of the, uh, the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. And the second one is that the curl of the electric field is equal 
to the time derivative of the magnetic field. So these two equations, let me call them A, these two equations are true everywhere. So not only in empty space, but everywhere. So also in material, so wherever you are, these equations are always satisfied by the magnetic and electric fields. And then we have two more equations that look like this. The curl of the uh, magnetic field, it's equal to the time derivative of the electric field. And also the divergence of the electric field is equal to zero. But these two equations written in this way, they are only true in empty space, okay? So this, this means that there are two types of Maxwell equations if you want. One's completely general and others that are material dependent. And we will actually talk about uh, the field inside materials uh, uh, like in the, uh, along the middle of the course or along the first weeks. And this quantity that I define in here, this parameter C, uh, I'm sure that I am not surprising you if I tell you that this is a quantity that it's essentially one over the square root of the electric permeability and the magnetic permittivity or the other way around. I never remember the names. Um, so essentially two electromagnetic constants, empirical constants that, um, that describe uh, uh, what happens with electric and magnetic fields. And you all know that this quantity here, which is approximately three times 10 to the eight meters per second, has units of speed and it actually coincides with the speed of light, uh, as we will see in a second. So essentially, this is something that I hope that you are all familiar with. So Maxwell equations in free space. And let me now show, because these equations in principle, you have three, uh, components for each field. So you have six uh, real fields that describe the electromagnetic field, but we will see in a second that actually uh, the electromagnetic field at the end can be described only with two components. And let me see how this happens. So first, uh, using what comes from equation A, as I said, these equations are completely generic on any material, on any system. So these are true everywhere. So A implies the following. Because the magnetic field has divergence zero, this means that we can always write it as the curl of some other vector field. OK that we will call vector potential. Okay. Now, on the other hand, uh, this automatically means from the second equation in A, so from this equation here, this automatically means that the electric field can be written as minus the time derivative of this vector potential A, but of course, because in this equation, we have the curl of E, this means that we can always add to this, so to this expression, this expression here, we can always add the uh, gradient of some scalar function that we will call uh, scalar potential. Okay. And uh, this form of the electric and magnetic fields is the most general form that satisfies equations A, okay? But this has already allowed us to show that out of the six, uh, initial uh, fields that we have, six components, uh, now we have reduced it to only four. So now we have the vector potential with three components and the scalar potential uh, with a single component. That's why we call it scalar. So now this is also, this is even more interesting because now you see the following. So what happens when I take my vector potential A and I change it 
by the gradient of some function. Let me call it lambda. So again, so this is really amazing. This is a, a beautiful structure that appears in electrodynamics. So because the magnetic field is defined as the curl of some vector potential or vector field, then if you change the vector field by a gradient, the curl of a gradient is always zero and the magnetic field doesn't change. So this means that you have a degree of freedom, so you have some level of freedom in choosing this vector potential. So what's observable is the magnetic field, that's the observable quantity. But this vector potential, which is some kind of mathematically uh, advantageous object, we have a freedom to choose it uh, up to the gradient of any function, okay? And of course, if you change the, the vector potential by a gradient of a function, then this means that in the electric field, you would change the electric field. So to keep the electric field uh, as it was, you also need to perform some change in the scalar potential, uh, which is the time derivative of, the, of this function lambda. So we say that there is a gauge invariance uh, for any scalar field lambda that is usually called gauge field or uh, something like this. And essentially, this is, a, this is a symmetry or this is a property of Maxwell equations that it's super useful because now we can do the following. Now we can define this lambda such that we always make the choice. of something that we will call the Coulomb gauge. Okay, in which we choose the vector potential, okay, to be, to have zero divergence. Okay, this is a choice that we can always make because if I give you a vector potential that doesn't satisfy this, you can always uh, find a function lambda that will correct A in such a way as to satisfy this equation, okay? So if we satisfy this, so if we satisfy that uh, A has zero divergence, then it's possible to show that this automatically sets to zero the scalar potential, at least for physical fields that have to die off sufficiently fast uh, when you go towards infinity. And when with all these properties together, now we can do the following. Now we can go back to equation B. So we still haven't used this equation B. Mm -hmm. And we can, uh, we can essentially write this form of the electric and magnetic fields substitute it in equations B and use these conditions in here allowed by the gauge invariance. And then we end up with an equation. So uh, I recommend you to try to prove it. You have it in the lecture notes as well. So you can check it there. But we find an equation that is very interesting and it looks like this. And probably you have seen this equation before, not only in electrodynamics, hopefully also in electrodynamics, but not only in electrodynamics, but probably almost in every subject that you have studied that involves space and time, uh, because this is something called the wave equation that was known way before um, uh, let's say Maxwell equations and way before, uh, way before classical physics as we know it. Um, so this wave equation is very interesting because 
it is telling us that uh, if you generate uh, some kind of electromagnetic disturbance anywhere, anywhere, uh, this equation essentially uh, tells you that you propagate that disturbance uh, with a speed that is given by C. Okay, so C is the speed at which electromagnetic waves move or propagate uh, in, uh, in, in empty space. And uh, regarding degrees of freedom of the electromagnetic field, this is really incredible because we have come a long way. So we started here with six, six uh, fields, six components of the electromagnetic field. And we end up here at the end with something that looks like three, but because we have a constraint, which is this one here, okay, this uh, implies that you have um, you have some kind of uh, relation between the three components of a at the end of the day this equation here has only two degrees of freedom or two uh, two scalar fields that you need to describe the electromagnetic field okay so is there any questions up to here i hope that this is all things that you know from electrodynamics but remember to just open your mic and interrupt me whenever you want. Okay, so now that we have a description of the electromagnetic field, and in particular, light will be uh, the electromagnetic field, but uh, for some special uh, configuration of these propagating waves. Um, now that we know this, let me now uh, talk about uh, something that I will call the quasi 1D approximation. And finally, we will quantize the electromagnetic field inside a cavity. Um, and uh, so let me explain to you what is this quasi 1D approximation first. So essentially, uh, right now we have this equation that has full generality, okay, in which we have a field that. Uh, can be pointing, so it's a vector that can be pointing in any direction. The direction might even depend on the space-time coordinate that you are looking. And then it depends on all space-time coordinates, x, y, z, and t, okay? Uh, however, for this course, uh, in order to remove all technical details that are not really relevant, and it's just, it just complicates the math, we will make one approximation, which is called this quasi 1D approximation. So quasi 1D approximation, which in which we will assume the following. So again, this is an approximation that is not fundamental. So everything that we are going to do can be done without this approximation, but all the calculations will be very simplified within this limit. So the first one is that we will assume that the field propagates uh, along the set direction. Okay, so as I said, we have a wave equation. The wave equation, if you create a disturbance, you can propagate the disturbance in all 3D. But we will assume, just for simplification, that we create a disturbance uh, that moves only in the set direction. Then we will then assume, so maybe just let me give you an idea of all these approximations in here. So if we have here x, y, and z, so what I am saying with this first approximation is that the electromagnetic field propagates along the set direction only. Then the second assumption that we will make is that the polarization uh, remains invariant. Invariant under propagation. So what does this mean? This means that uh, when you look at any point uh, in set, so in any point, well, set or x and y, so any point in space time, uh, the vector field, so the vector uh, A, 
we'll, we will assume that it's always pointing. Okay. It's always pointing in one specific direction that we will just call uh, x axis. Okay. So E x. And uh, uh, well, you, I hope you are all, all familiar with the name polarization, but the polarization refers just to the direction in which the vector points. Okay. So, uh, okay. So this is the other approximation we are doing. And finally, we are doing one more approximation, which is that the transverse profile, so the transverse profile of the field, uh, and by transverse profile, I mean the following. So by transverse profile, I mean what happens in this plane in here. Okay, so we have a plane that is transverse to the propagation set. So it's the x, y plane um, at a given set. And we will assume that the transverse profile of the field uh, in that plane uh, also remains invariant with the propagation. So it doesn't change with propagation. And in particular, we will assume that it's homogeneous. And homogeneous essentially means that uh, is not, so let me maybe make a bit more space in here. That is not a function of X and Y. Okay, so essentially we have in here, Uh, a transverse profile that has the same value of the electric and magnetic fields or the vector potential A in all the transverse plane, okay? This is just uh, for simplicity, as I say. So none of these approximations is required to quantize electromagnetic field. It will just simplify the problem a lot and remove a lot of technical and spurious details that uh, are really not relevant for the physics that we will discuss. And in any case, in the lecture notes, and you can also ask me and maybe even do a project about it, you, you have references uh, in which you can see how to quantize electromagnetic field in many other types of geometries or may, many other types of even general uh, conditions. Okay, so just keep this approximation in mind. And let me just bring this plot in here and then let me now so now that we know in words the approximation let me put it in math so what does this mean for the uh, uh, for the vector potential so this means for the vector potential that for each time okay we can expand the vector potential in the following way so first of all, it's going to be just a function of set and t, okay? This we know because as I said, we assume that the transverse profile is independent of x and y, it's just homogeneous. Second, we know that the direction of the field is always going to be x direction, okay? Then now all that is left is a function, so a scalar function of set and t. But we know that we can expand any function of set, any function of set we want, we can expand it in the set of what is usually called plane waves or Fourier spatial modes, just exponentials of i, k, set, okay? So we can expand uh, any function a of set t or any function of set, we can expand it in this uh, basis, which is a basis uh, for functions that fall sufficiently fast when you go towards infinity, as it has to happen for physical uh, electric fields and uh, magnetic fields. And now the only thing is that because, of course, uh, this function depends on time, not only on set, 
then the expansion coefficients qk will be time dependent so we have qk of t and i call the expansion coefficients qk but i will still allow for some global normalization factor so this is just a choice so we have we have expansion coefficients that all together are this quantity here so qk multiplied by n but I will separate it because it will be convenient as you will see why in a second. So again, let me just make it clear. These are just expansion coefficients. Oops. Expansion coefficients in the uh, plane wave basis. Then, um, this is just a convenient global normalization that we will choose later. And now something important is this k here. So in principle, I told you that you can expand any function of set. You can expand it in this plane wave expansion e to the i k set. And that's true as long as k uh, is, you have to sum over all the possible real numbers. So in principle, k can be any real number. And in fact, in free space, that's the case. So if you are quantizing or you are writing the uh, electric and magnetic fields so the vector potential in free space this is completely true so you can always write it as a sum of plane waves with a, an arbitrary real number k but it's very interesting that if you have boundary conditions so boundary conditions that so you are you have your electric and magnetic fields in some kind of domain and if for example you have materials around it or you have some kind of shield or whatever this imposes boundary conditions on the electric and magnetic fields that restrict the number of wave vectors so we will call k wave vector so the number of wave vectors that uh, you can have so essentially the boundary conditions restrict this case and we are going to see it right now with a specific example okay so please is this clear so is it clear the type of approximation that we are doing i am not justifying it i am just justifying it telling you that it's a convenient approximation from the mathematical point of view that doesn't change the physics much uh, and that everything we are going to do can be generalized for any kind of uh, field without any approximations. And is it clear how from this approximation we can write the vector potential in this form? So hopefully everyone understands. Otherwise, please, again, just stop me and ask. Okay. So if that's clear, then... Uh, let me proceed with one specific example okay, of uh, a space in which we are going to quantize electromagnetic field. And this example is just an optical cavity. So I hope you can all see here a pretty optical cavity. So we are going to always work in this course uh, with a cavity. And in particular, this is a very special cavity because it's a, an ideal cavity that has length L made from two mirrors to mirrors that are perfect conductors. So we will ass assume that we have a cavity made out of perfect, perfectly conducting uh, mirrors. Okay, and why are we doing this? Because for perfect conductors, we know we know what are the 
uh, boundary conditions that they imposed uh, on these surfaces. In particular, you might remember from your electrodynamics course that um, the component of the electric field that is parallel to the surface of a conductor, of a perfect conductor, has to vanish. That has to be zero, okay? Um, if you don't remember it, just go to your electrodynamics books and you will see why this happens. Um, and, uh, but let's take it for granted for now. Then on the other hand, this implies the following. So we know that the electric field points in the X direction because that's the part of the approximation that I made, that the field is always pointing in the X direction. So this means that the electric field is already parallel to this surface. And then essentially this, these two mirrors, these perfectly conducting mirrors imposed the following boundary conditions. So first, the electric field in this mirror, so in the surface of this mirror, has to vanish. So the electric field at set equals zero, okay, has to be zero. On the other hand, the electric field at the other mirrors, at the other end of the cavity, so here in this surface, which is L, it also has to vanish. So now from these two boundary conditions, it's completely trivial to now using this expansion for the uh, vector potential, it's very trivial to find that these two um, conditions impose a restriction on the coefficients Q that we can generate and on the wave vector scale that we can generate inside of this space. And in particular, I write, uh, I write the final conditions, but please, go to the lecture notes and check the proof and try to prove it yourself uh, to make sure that you understand it. So the first thing that happens is the following, is that Q of K, so the amplitude of wave vector K has to be equal to minus the amplitude of wave vector minus K, okay? So this is the first, uh, the first thing that the boundary conditions impose. And the second thing that they, they impose is that the wave vectors K, they have to be an integer, so a multiple, integer multiple of pi divided by L, okay? Not just any K is allowed, only the ones that are integers of this uh, quantity that we will call KN. So N is a natural number. Okay, and as I said, this quantization, if you want, of the wave vectors, this has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It's just classical, classical quantization of the possible available wave vectors in your system uh, for the electromagnetic field. These two conditions come naturally from the boundary conditions, okay? Uh, so come mathematically from the boundary conditions. However, it's very interesting that these two conditions can also be interpreted uh, from just a very, very physical point of view. And this is what I want to discuss now with you. So the physical meaning of these two conditions. So for this, let's go to the cavity and imagine that just at some point, okay, you generate, you generate some type of um, amplitude uh, in mode with wave vector k, okay? So you generate qk. Uh, this means that the field will start propagating in the plus k direction. So assume that k is positive. Uh, but then what happens when the, the field arrives to the mirror? So it cannot penetrate it, so it will just reflect. Okay, and I hope that everyone agrees with that. So if I create a disturbance here, I create some electromagnetic energy, some disturbance that moves in K. So in plus set, it goes, it goes towards the mirror and when it hits the mirror, it comes back. But when it comes back, that's precisely what it means to have an amplitude Q of minus K, because now it's propagating in the minus K direction. So in other words, 
you cannot generate inside a cavity, you cannot generate uh, amplitude k without also exciting amplitude minus k because that's what the cavity will do naturally. So in other words, uh, we cannot distinguish left from right in the sense of direction of propagation. Inside a cavity, this is not possible. And then this means that there has to be a relation, there has to be a relation between Q of K and Q of minus K. Okay, now the second thing is the following. So we generate in here a disturbance with a well-defined wave vector K, uh, and then it propagates, it will, so as I was saying, it will just move in the plus K direction, it will, uh, it will reflect, it will move in minus K, then reflect back and start moving again in plus K, and eventually it will come back to the point that it was, okay? Now, when we have generated the field in here and it propagates and makes what we call a round trip, okay, so a complete round trip in the cavity, uh, just from this expression, you can see that it has to accumulate a phase that it's e to the i, k, and the space that it has covered. So how much space has it covered uh, in this case? 2L. So the distance that the, the ray of light has covered is two times the cavity length because it has made a complete round trip, okay? So it picks up a phase that it's 2IKL, but it wouldn't make too much sense that I generate the field inside the cavity with one phase and then just after propagation inside the cavity. And as we have said, propagation doesn't mean much in a cavity because whenever you can generate a disturbance in the cavity, it will fill the whole cavity. It doesn't make sense that it has a different phase than the one that it had in there. So this automatically means that uh, this exponent here, so 2i k l, that has to be a multiple of 2 pi in order for this to be equal to one. So this condition that the phase accumulated over a round trip uh, has to be equal to one or has to be equal to a multiple of two pi. This is what uh, generates this kind of uh, quantization of the wave vector. So this is an intuitive way of seeing it. And sometimes what we say is that the modes have to reproduce uh, let me write this properly. Have to reproduce themselves after a cavity round trip. Okay. So as you see, these two mathematical conditions, they also come from a very, very physical point of view. Okay. And, but if you don't believe your physical intuition, which uh, it's good to have it, but it's also good to test it mathematically always, okay? So never trust 100% your physical intuition, always go to the math. Then you can also prove it just from this mathematical condition here, okay? So this means that at the end of the day, uh, if we now, come back to the expression of the, of the vector potential. And we substitute these two conditions, this one in here and this one in here. We can write the vector potential in the following simplified way. So we will have the normalization factor pointing in the direction X. And now we will have a sum over wave vectors, but now the wave vectors are labeled by an index N. 
so by an integer that goes from one to infinity. And now the amplitudes, the amplitudes are common to the modes plus k and minus k, and we will just call them qn. And now when you sum uh, with the minus sign, this is important, with the minus sign, when you uh, combine this, um, so this exponential of plus k set and exponential of minus k set, then you just get a sign function of k, k n set. Okay. So this is essentially a, what we can write for the a vector potential. And then automatically this means, so perhaps just a warning, uh, if you just add up the exponential k set and the exponential minus k set, what you get is 2i the sign. Okay, so you have a factor 2i, but that factor 2i, you can always put it inside this normalization uh, coefficient, this normalization factor. So we just forget uh, about that kind of uh, numerical factors. Okay, then now the electric field. We know that the electric field is just the time derivative with a minus sign of the vector potential. And this means that the electric field, we can write it in this form. Now we will have the time derivative of the coefficients, but the same spatial profiles, sine functions. And then for the magnetic field, the magnetic field, oh, sorry, there is a minus in here. And then the magnetic field is just the curl of the vector potential. And if you take the curl of this vector potential, which points in this direction and depends only on set, the only component of the curl that, sur that survives is the y component. So this is very interesting because it's telling you that if the electric field points in the x direction, the magnetic field points in the y direction. So they are orthogonal. This is something that probably you already know from electrodynamics or optics. And then you have to take the derivative of the sine function with respect to set. And that gives you a Kn and a cosine. But the coefficient is exactly the same Q and T because it doesn't depend on set. Okay, so now we have the form of the electric and magnetic fields inside the region we care about, which is inside an optical cavity. Okay, and then now what we are going to do is we are going to talk about a part of the electromagnetic field that we still didn't talk about too much, which are these uh, coefficients Q. They are functions on of time, but which functions of time, what do they mean? Uh, how do they behave? So that's what we are going to do now. And in particular, it's very nice now that we can find evolution equations. Evolution equations for these amplitudes, for these coefficients, qn of t, by doing something very simple. We simply take the wave equation. So the wave equation because we don't have dependence on x and y, it will just be c square derivative of z square, and then the derivative of t square acting on a. Uh, this we know that it's equal to zero, but now what we do is that we can project this equation onto our mode functions or the spatial profiles of the modes inside the cavity. So we can make this kind of integration. So we can project the equation onto mode sine of kn. And this uh, automatically, so you can, you can prove it yourself very easily with this, uh, with this result. So you know something, you know that the integration from zero to L of two of such sine functions 
with arbitrary indices Kn and Km. This is equal to a, a delta function of the indices. So only when the sign is of the same wave length, um, uh, the integral is not zero. And in that case, we have L over two. And it's the same with the cosine. So the cosine functions satisfy the same because we will use it later. But for projecting the wave equation onto these mode functions, you only need the integration of the signs. And then if you just use this, uh, this result, you can prove very easily that this equation here is equivalent. So it's equivalent. So up to, up to some numerical factor. So it's proportional in particular to this equation here. Uh, where I have defined a frequency that is just c times the wave vector kn. And this equation, it's something that I'm sure that you all know very well. This is just the equation for the amplitude of a harmonic oscillator. So this is a harmonic oscillator equation. So this is very interesting because we have been able to prove that the expansion coefficients uh, obey a harmonic oscillator equation. So we are kind of in the right track to make a correspondence between the electromagnetic field inside a cavity and a collection of harmonic oscillators. So a mechanical model based on harmonic oscillators. And in particular, we can push this even further. And this is now uh, the final part before quantization, which is we can compute the electromagnetic energy. So we can compute the electromagnetic energy inside the cavity. And again, from your electrodynamics course, you probably know that the electromagnetic energy, it's nothing but one half of the integration over the full volume that we are evaluating the energy on, in particular in our case is the cavity. So the integration over the 3D, the volume of the cavity. And then we have essentially E square that of course depends on R and T plus B square with some uh, empirical constants. Okay, so E square plus B square, that's what you have learned all in electrodynamics, that's the uh, electromagnetic energy in a volume. So now what all we have to do is we go to these forms that we have for the electric and the magnetic fields, we introduce them. So we substitute them in these expressions here, and we actually use this integration in here, or this uh, expression in here and we will find out something very interesting and in particular if we if we substitute the electric and magnetic fields we get the following so this is going to be a long expression but let me guide you through it so first the electric and magnetic fields uh, they do not depend on x and y as we have been discussing in the approximation that we are in so then the integration over x and y, that just gives you some kind of surface integral that is the surface of the cavity. And we will just assume uh, that this is a quantity that we call S and is just the finite area of the cavity. Hmm. Okay. So then on the other hand, now we have uh, these sums in here. So we will have two of such sums because we have a square and we will have sum of m n from one to infinity. And then the integration in the set coordinate from zero to L, that's the volume of the cavity. And now, uh, just by substitution, what we get is epsilon zero, 
qm dot qm dot that comes from e square and then the sign profiles and now the part of the magnetic field so i have written the part with q dot and sign from the electric field and now the part of the magnetic field is just qn q uh, kn qn and cosine and this is giving you something that looks like this q n q m and then the cosines okay i hope i didn't mess anything up and now this is very nice because essentially we can use now so we have the integration over set of sine sine and cosine cosine but we know that this is the delta function and normalized with l over two and therefore if we choose if we choose an n so now it comes why we put here an n factor so if we choose an n this is our choice that it's two times divided epsilon zero l s okay so it's a very easy factor it's just two over the uh, electric um, permeability and then this is the volume of the cavity l times s so if we do that and let me also redefine this qn dot so the derivative of qn i will just call it pn okay i think that you know where i am getting to so then what we find is that this whole expression so this very big expression at the end takes a very simple form and the very simple form is just this one here So, can anyone recognize what this is? So, I hope that you are all familiar with this. It's one of the first examples that you study in classical mechanics. This is the Hamiltonian of a harmonic oscillator, and therefore, the electromagnetic energy is just equivalent. To the Hamiltonian of a collection of independent harmonic oscillators. So, yes. Let's take a minute to digest this result because this is a super important result in quantum optics and uh, quantization of fields or quantum field theory, which is that we started from a field theory. We started from Maxwell equations in particular, and we have been able to put in correspondence this, uh, this, this field theory, this theory of fields, we have put it in correspondence with a mechanical model based on just harmonic oscillators. So we have done it for this specific simple approximation of quasi 1D in an optical cavity and so on. But this is exactly what you can do for any field theory uh, that it's free, that is non-interacting. So a non-interacting theory of fields, this you can do. You can always make a correspondence between the theory of fields, no matter which fields, how complicated they are, and some kind of harmonic oscillator model. And then now, once we have this connection between the field theory and the mechanical model, we can proceed to quantize the field theory. So quantization, sorry. So quantization just proceeds 
in the standard way of quantum mechanics that tells you, as we discussed already last week, that you can replace positions in momenta by some operators, operator position and operator momentum that satisfy a certain algebra, certain uh, commutation relations. So I will write here one of them. So, and this is what we call the canonical commutation relations. Okay, so welcome everyone to your first field quantization, hopefully. Uh, this is a very important moment for you. I know it looks extremely simple, but it is extremely simple. I mean, quantum field theory is not so complicated. It's really just a theory of putting in correspondence field theories with mechanical models and then proceeding with what we call canonical quantization, which is just applying canonical commutation relations to the generalized positions and momentum. So just a note, uh, in here we did a quantization that it's very simple um, and in particular is not relativistic in the sense that it's not invariant under relativistic transformations and the Lorentz transformations. And the reason is the following. So Maxwell equations, can anyone tell me if Maxwell equations are invariant under Lorentz transformations? Is this a problem maybe that we start from some equations that are not invariant under Lorentz transformations? So please, whoever is brave enough, open the mic and say yes or no. I don't even look, I don't know who you are. Huh, someone wrote in the chat. That was half brave, but yes, of course, Maxwell equations are invariant under Lorentz transformations. That's how Einstein arrived to uh, Lorentz transformations or one of the ways in which he did it. So he just proved he wanted to find the most general transformations, space-time transformations that, um, that are, are live invariant Maxwell equations. However, we are working in a specific gauge so we are working in this Coulomb gauge. And this Coulomb gauge, as you see here, this expression here, so the fact that the wave vector, we have asked the wave vector to be divergence free, so divergence equal to zero. This is a non-relativistic expression, is not Lorentz invariant, because you see that this has some privilege over spatial derivatives. We have no time derivatives in here, okay? So then we have quantized electromagnetic field without being a Lorentz invariant. And for the type of quantum optics that we do and for, for low energy physics, this is completely fine. There is no problem. But for high energy physics, if you study quantum field theory, you will see that canonical quantization, it's a little bit more uh, involved just because you have to preserve Lorentz invariance. If you are at very high energies, you want to be manifestly uh, invariant under Lorentz transformations. So if you study particle physics and quantum field theory, you will repeat this thing in a more elaborate way. Okay, so, well, and also if you want, you can do a project on this for the course, if you are interested in quantization in more relativist, relativistic settings or even including matter degrees of freedom. Okay, so any questions up to here? I hope that you are, happy now that you know how to quantize electromagnetic field as i said it's a very important moment in the life of any uh, quantum physicist first field quantization and um, otherwise if there are no questions then what i will do now is well we have shown that the electromagnetic field is just a collection of harmonic oscillators so the quantum theory of the electromagnetic field is nothing but the quantum theory of the harmonic oscillator. So then now what we are going to do for the next uh, couple of weeks 
it's I will review, uh, well, I will explain you the quantum theory of the harmonic oscillator. We will start from something that you know, which is just quantization of the harmonic oscillator uh, with Dirac formalism and number states, Fox states and all this thing uh, that we will do now. Uh, but then we will move on to things that probably you haven't heard of and are very, very important in the field of quantum optics, um, as we will see. So then let me start. Uh, let me start first from the classical harmonic oscillator. So let me remind you just a couple of details about the classical theory of the harmonic oscillator. So the classical theory of the harmonic oscillator can be derived or everything can be derived from a Hamiltonian that we have just written, which is P square plus omega square Q square. And now I am allowing the oscillator to have any mass M. Okay. In the electromagnetic field, we saw that the mass is just naturally equal to one. So now how do you find or how do you describe the harmonic oscillator? The state of the harmonic oscillator is described by one particular choice of P and Q. So if you know P and Q, then you know the state of the oscillator. So what is the position and the velocity of the oscillator? Uh, and how to find the dynamics of this state is just by making use of Hamilton's equations. Or at least this is one way that you know from your uh, theoretical mechanics courses. So, and in particular applied to this Hamiltonian, this is just very simple. One just gives you the definition of momentum. So it's M times the speed, the velocity. And the other one just gives you um, a Newton's equation, which is uh, minus KQ. So M minus, so M omega square Q. So now these equations are linear in P and Q. So they are very simple to solve. And in particular, if we start from some initial condition at time zero, the position of the oscillator is A and the velocity. So the momentum is M times some velocity, some speed B. Then it's very easy to find the uh, solutions for q of t and p of t uh, which we will just normalize to m omega you will see in a second y so it's just convenient then the solution just looks as something very simple just for q is a times the cosine of omega t plus v uh, uh, over omega times uh, the sine of omega t. Now for p, we have kind of the uh, complementary of that. So it's v over omega cosine of omega t minus a sine of omega t. Okay. So, okay, this is an expression. It looks a bit mathematical, whatever, but now we can actually plot what happens in the space of P and Q uh, in particular. So let me make it a bit smaller. So in particular in here, what happens is the following. So we are going to represent the trajectory or the states of the harmonic oscillator in the space of position and momentum normalized to m over omega. This is called phase space, so the space of position and momentum. And then starting at some point in phase space that has a position A and momentum m b, or normalized is b over omega, then what this equation tells you is that you are just doing a rotation with a, some angular frequency omega which means that the oscillator starting at this point, it will start moving in a circle. This is why we normalize P to M over omega. Then we have a circle, a perfect circle uh, at constant angular speed, okay? And then after a time two pi over omega, uh, it comes back to the original point. This is the reason why we call it 
harmonic oscillator because it periodically comes back to the original point where we started in phase space. Uh, then just one more detail that might be useful for later in the course. Uh, instead of using this representation in terms of real position and real momentum, sometimes it's useful to use what we call the complex representation in which we define a variable a complex variable that is just a complex variable associated to phase space and in particular it has q as a real part and p as the imaginary part so again normalized to m over omega and in terms of this complex variable uh, which we usually call a normal variable. Okay. In terms of this variable, then the trajectory looks extremely simple because it essentially looks like this. So first of all, the amplitude, so the magnitude of this complex number or this complex variable is fixed to the starting radius of the circle that we call r and then the phase has a very simple solution because the phase will just look like some initial phase and the initial phase is essentially just wherever you started from so this is phi of zero okay so it's the phase you start from and uh, and then it decreases linearly with time uh, at some speed omega and that's why we call it angular frequency because it it gives us the rate of change of the phase okay so this is all i want you to know about the classical harmonic oscillator so it describes just a periodic periodically periodic motion in uh, over a circle in phase space and then now let's move on to talk about the quantum theory of the harmonic oscillator so okay how do we do the quantum theory of the harmonic oscillator so as we have seen we simply take the classical hamiltonian so p square over 2m plus m omega square over 2 q square and we replace positional momentum by positional momentum operators that satisfy these commutational relations okay so of course whenever we say i hope that was clear from the beginning but whenever we say that an operator is equal to a number what we are omitting is that it's proportional to an identity. So whenever we have a number on an expression uh, with an operator, then this is uh, it's just the identity. Um, okay, so now the first question in quantum mechanics that you always have to ask whenever you have a system that you want to describe is what is the Hilbert space in which uh, I have to describe my system? So what is the Hilbert space that I associate to my system? How is it? So in particular, in this case, we will find the corresponding Hilbert space, so the Hilbert space of the harmonic oscillator. We will find it uh, just by diagonalizing. By diagonalizing uh, the Hamiltonian, okay? So then in the next uh, few lines, I will show you how to diagonalize a Hamiltonian. I know that you are all familiar with it, with annihilation and creation operators and so on, but I'm not sure if you have seen all the details uh, uh, in, 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 real, in real precision. So then I would like to discuss them. So first of all, uh, in quantum optics, we are always going to work with normalized version of position and momentum, something that we call the quadratures. Quadratures. So as I said, these are just normalized versions of position and momentum. So in particular, we have the 
position quadrature, which is just the position coordinate or the position operator, uh, normalized to some value, some um, value with length units uh, that we call Q ZPF. And ZPF stands for something called zero point fluctuations that you will understand uh, just in a minute. So why we give this name zero point fluctuations. So for now, it's just a name, just a label. And in particular, these zero point fluctuations are equal to the square root of h bar divided to um, omega. Okay, you can check that this expression has units of length. And then we also define the momentum operator. Sorry, the momentum quadrature which is a momentum operator divided by also some normalization of the momentum, ZPF, that it's essentially H bar M omega divided by two, okay? Um, so now we have dimensionless position and momentum and this is very interesting for several reasons. First of all, because it allows us to remove uh, constants out of the picture. In particular, now the Hamiltonian, it will look in the following way. So if you just make the substitution of position and momentum by these quadratures, you will see that the Hamiltonian can be rewritten in this way. So it's just x squared plus p squared without any constants multiplying them and so on. And yes, there is an overall factor h bar omega over four, uh, which means that we have gotten rid of the mass. So the mass now is just in the normalization of positional momentum. And moreover, now the commutation relation between x and t, okay, the commutation relation between x and t, the quadratures, is 2i, so just again substitute uh, in terms of positional momentum, and we have we have get rid of uh, h bar. Okay, and we will see later that this is also very nice because um, I remind you that in the uncertainty principle, uh, the, the 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 uncertainty principle is defined as one half of the absolute value of the commutator. So now you see that because the commutator is equal to 2 to i, then we get a, a, a lower bound for the um, uncertainty principle that it's equal to 1. So somehow we have set the basic level of Heisenberg's uncertainty relation between x and p to 1. And we will see that this is, this is useful. OK. so. Then this is the Hamiltonian that we want to diagonalize. In principle, um, I mean, I, I cannot surprise you because you have already seen the quantization of the harmonic oscillator, but in principle, you know, if you are not an expert, then you might think that this Hamiltonian is very difficult to diagonalize because O is the sum of two operators that do not commute. And if I cannot diagonalize, non-commuting operators, how can I diagonalize the sum? This looks a bit complicated. Well, of course, we know much better than that. So we are much better at quantum mechanics than that. And we know that we can diagonalize this Hamiltonian very easily if we define a new operator. Okay, we define a new operator that uh, it's just equivalent to the normal variable that I defined for the classical harmonic oscillator. So this complex variable that has position as the real part and momentum as the imaginary part. Okay, so if we do this, which of course it's equivalent to uh, saying that the position is equal to A dagger plus A and the momentum it's equal to I times a dagger minus A, okay? And you will see why in a second, but these operators, these new operators, we call it, we call them creation operator and A, we call it a annihilation operator. Okay, 
So they are not independent. One is the uh, adjoint of the other. So annihilation and creation operators, you will see why the name in a second. Then the Hamiltonian, in terms of this operator, uh, it looks uh, in the following way. So it's very simple. We get h bar omega over two, a dagger a plus a, a dagger. But because uh, positional momentum, they obey some commutation relations, then we know that the annihilation operator will also obey some commutation relations. And in particular, a dagger with a, it's equal to one. That's the basic commutation relation for the annihilation and creation operators. And then this means that we can uh, write uh, we can write a a dagger. We can rewrite it using the commutator as a dagger a plus one, meaning that at the end, the final Hamiltonian, we can write it as this thing here. So we have come a long way, a very long way. So starting from a Hamiltonian that looked a little bit threatening, we have managed to turn it into sorry so we have taken the hamiltonian and we have written it just in terms of a single operator this operator we will call it n which is number operator and again you will see why in a second uh, so this operator in here uh, so essentially we only need to diagonalize a single operator that it's this uh, n or number operator that also has a very simple structure. Uh, first of all, it's a Hermitian operator, so it's a self adjoint operator. Oh, yes, sorry, someone is pointing out that the commutation relation is wrong. Sorry. Thank you. So we have a, a dagger equal one. So, yeah, so well, as I was saying, then this means that uh, in order to diagonalize the Hamiltonian, we only need to find the eigen spectrum, so the eigen values and eigen vectors of this operator n, which is just a dagger a. It is a self adjoint operator, and we will see that because it has this funny structure a dagger a. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, there is someone writing. So can everyone hear me? So is people hearing me? Okay, then please, Milad, uh, the problem with my voice is yours. It's not my microphone. So please take care of it in your computer. Maybe restart or something. Um, okay. So then what we are going to do now is we are going to use the properties of this very nice operator, a dagger a, in order to find the spectrum of, the, of, of it. And through the spectrum of this operator, we will infer what is the Hilbert space we are dealing with for a harmonic oscillator. So in particular, uh, we will find the spectrum of this operator uh, using four, pro sorry, five properties of this operator. So let me first denote just the eigenvalues of this operator. I will denote them by n. We still don't know what n is, just some eigenvalue. And then the corresponding eigenvectors, I will label them with the same uh, eigenvalue, n. And we will see that we don't have the generalities, so these labels are enough. And then, as I said, uh, I am going to use five properties. So let's go through the properties. So the first property, it's just the following. So the first property is that the uh, number operator is what we call a positive semi-definite, definite, okay? What does it mean, positive semi-definite, which we will always write in this way. So 
uh, this is a symbolic notation because of course an operator is an operator is not a number so an operator cannot be larger than a number what we mean when we write this is that it is positive semi-definite which means that the eigenvalues of this operator are larger or equal than zero so are positive or zero or uh, also the following condition which is very simple to show So if we take the expectation value of this operator in any state, so we take any state of the Hilbert space and we take the expectation value, uh, this thing here, so this part here and this part here, they are related by, a, by emission conjugation, by, by self-adjoint, uh, the self-adjoint uh, operation. Sorry, the adjoint operation. Uh, then this essentially means that what we are doing is taking the scalar product of this vector with itself. But the scalar product of a vector with itself, that's nothing but the norm square of the vector. And the norm square of a vector is always larger or equal than zero. Okay. So since this is true for any operate for any vector psi we say that the operator is positive semi-definite and we can show just applying this expression to the eigenstates so if we take psi to be an eigenstate then this automatically implies that n so the eigenvalues have to be larger or equal than zero okay So from this property, we have found that the eigenvectors, sorry, the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues, we still don't know what they are, but they are positive or zero. That's for sure. We also know one more thing. We know that the operator N is Hermitian, so it's self-adjoint, okay? So then the eigenvectors form an orthonormal base and so on, as we are going to prove a bit more uh, in a second. So the second property, that probably you are familiar with as well, that we will use in order to find the spectrum is the following fact. So because of the, of the basic commutation relation uh, that A with A dagger is equal to one, okay, that I wrote wrong at the beginning, uh, then we can also show that the uh, number operator the commutator of the number operator with A is just A, okay? And similarly, the commutator of the number operator with A dagger, it's minus A dagger. And actually, this expression here is nothing but the uh, adjoint or the emission conjugate of this expression here. If you take the dagger of this expression, you get this one, okay? But then this is very interesting. So perhaps just very quickly, in order to prove this relation here, okay, it's very important that you remember that for commutators, you always have this relation. So A, B commuting with C, that's equal to, I put A away of the commutator on each side. So it's, if it's on the left, I keep it on the left, and then I do the commutator of B with C, and then I do the opposite. I do the commutator of A with C and I take B outside from each side. So on the right side in this case, okay? So using, using this expression here, so this trick, you just find that this commutator is equal to A. So just try by yourself if you don't remember how to do it, okay? So then uh, this relation here, if I apply this expression, so if I apply this expression here onto an eigenstate n, then I can rewrite it in this funny way. So we have one part of the commutator, so n a acting on the state n, that's equal to n minus one, And then um, 
uh, acting on or just multiplying a n but this is very interesting because this is telling us the following this is saying that the, the state a acting on n okay it's also an eigenstate of the operator n of the number operator with eigenvalue n minus one okay so this means that the uh, this means that the vector a n has to be proportional to the vector n minus one okay so to eigenstate a minus one and we call the proportionality factor k1 okay now we can prove something similar in the case of the second expression in this case what we can prove is that the state a dagger n is also an eigenstate of the number operator uh, with eigenvalue n plus one. And this again automatically implies that the uh, vector a dagger acting on n is proportional to the vector n plus one. Okay. So this is very interesting and actually we can find the constants and proportionality factors just taking the norms so if we take the norm of this expression so we do the inner product of this vector with itself and this vector with itself we automatically find the following we find n a dagger a n it's equal to k1 square and n minus one and minus one okay yes uh yes and on the other hand so let me maybe move this a bit away on the other hand a dagger a it's the operator n so the number operator and acting on the state n this just gives the eigenvalue so then this is equivalent to n n with n okay so now from these expressions uh, we automatically find that if n with n is equal to one so if we can normalize the eigenvectors n and we can normalize as well the eigenvectors n minus one then automatically so this implies that k1 is equal to the square root of n okay then on the other hand so i do the other one very quickly so uh, again we take the norm of this expression and the norm of this expression looks Sorry, I forgot the hats in there. So the norm of this expression looks like this. And now A with A dagger, we already wrote it once as A dagger A plus one using the commutation relation. And A dagger A acting on N, A dagger A acting on N, we know that it's just the eigenvalue times the same eigenvector. So then in here we get n plus one n n n on the other side we just have k2 square and n plus one n plus one so again assuming that these vectors are normalizable and we have normalized them to one uh, then we get k2 equal square root of n plus one okay so then we have this interesting property uh, and then finally i give you two more properties so i think i said five properties but one of the properties is just that the operator is self-adjoint because since the operator is self-adjoint i can do the following what happens if I take the matrix element Nm onto, uh, the, the, onto the vector, sorry, the, the number operator, 
Well, first of all, I can make N act on M, and this gives me just M, and then NM. But on the other hand, because the operator is self-adjoint, so N is equal to N dagger, this automatically means that I can also make N act on to this N in here, so the eigenvector N, and then instead I get the eigenvalue N. Okay. So then with these properties, this automatically implies, uh, so if I just, if I just bring this <coughs> expression, I bring it uh, to the uh, left, then we get an expression that looks like this, m minus n, n, m is equal to zero. And this automatically implies the condition n, m equal zero when n is different than m, which means that the eigenvectors of this emission operator are orthogonal. Okay. This, you see that I have only used uh, self adjointness. So, this is true for every self adjoint operator that the, the eigenstates in the absence of any degeneracies are orthogonal. So, and finally, the final property I want to show is that the state with n equals zero is normalizable. Okay, so uh, we will not show this uh, right now. So we have to wait just a little, little bit, um, but I will show it uh, in, a, in a second. So we have these four properties and these four properties together, they imply something very interesting. So the property one to four, so these four properties, they automatically imply that n can only be the natural numbers, including the zero, so the positive integers, including the zero. And this is very easy to understand because we have seen that every time we apply the operator a onto the eigenvector n, we get an eigenvalue that it's n minus one. So, um, then automatically, well, maybe let me also give you one more property, but this is actually an implication of this, that the annihilation operator acting on vacuum that gives you zero, that's automatic from this expression here. Okay, so this expression here, A acting on zero, it's proportional to N minus one, whatever that is, but with proportionality factor k1, and k1 is equal to the square root of zero, which is zero, and therefore A acting on vacuum is zero. So if n wouldn't be a positive integer starting in zero to infinity, then it would be possible with the annihilation operator to go down the spectrum to negative numbers. So imagine that n is equal to 1.5. Then I apply a, I get 0 0.5. I apply a again, I get minus 0 0.5. But we have this property that n cannot be negative, which means automatically that n can only be 0, 1, 2, etc. So in other words, this is what we call a lower bounded. operator or if you want oops if you want a lower bounded spectrum so this operator has a lower bounded spectrum so now all these conditions together are very interesting because they are telling us that the Hilbert space of a harmonic oscillator is just the prototypical 
infinite dimensional uh, Hilbert space. Okay, in particular with a basis that is given by these uh, eigenstates of the number operator, which tell us that we have a prototypical infinite dimensional Hilbert space because the basis is countable with an index that it's an integer. Um, and in particular, we call these states or these bases FOC or number states. Okay. And they are defined by the following properties. They are eigenstates of the number operator and the annihilation operator allows us to run through the spectrum uh, downstairs. So they connect n minus one with n and the a dagger operator, so the creation operator, it allows us to run the spectrum upstairs, okay? So then this thing together, it's essentially the main result of this part. We have found that the uh, Hilbert space of a harmonic oscillator is just an infinite dimensional Hilbert space of the type that we know and love, but with just an infinite basis. And this has um, a number of physical consequences that I want to discuss now before we finish. So, and uh, the physical consequences are the following. So let me start with them. So, well, maybe be before that, I think that you are all familiar with this derivation. I made it very slowly because I wanted to, I wanted you to remember the key points of everything. Um, but if you have any questions, please, uh, again, interrupt me and let me know before we move on to the next part. So, otherwise, uh, I will just give you the first um, physical consequence of this, which is that energy is quantized. So this is one of the first times, I mean, when you saw the harmonic oscillator for the first time, in which you found in a very simple system that if you measure the energy, if you measure the energy of the harmonic oscillator, this energy is not just any real number as it happens with the classical harmonic oscillator, but it has to be a number that is just an integer factor of h bar omega. So quantization appears very naturally just from the commutation relations, just from the postulate of commutation relations. And, and it tells us this amazing result that not all energies are allowed in a harmonic oscillator. Uh, so we were fooled by classical physics somehow. And so, well, this is what happens. When we perform an energy measurement of the harmonic oscillator, we will get only one of these eigenvalues. Um, there are a number of things. So then we call N the number of excitations. So for N equals zero, we have the minimal energy. And then if we start putting N, we have more and more energy since the energy happens on discrete increments, then we call them excitations or quanta. Okay. And then the ground state. So 
So the ground state of the Hamiltonian, which is just the state with zero excitations and equals zero, uh, we use the notation that we call it the vacuum, vacuum uh, state. So I don't know if you are familiar with this, but in quantum optics, we are always talking about the vacuum state associated to a harmonic oscillator, and that means n equals zero, the, the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. Okay, then um, we have also a second consequence that it's very interesting, which is the following. So classically, so the classical ground state energy it's equal to so who can write the fastest what is the ground state so the minimal energy of this hamiltonian here well this hamiltonian here tick tock tick Talk. Come on, don't be shy. What is the minimal energy that you can put in here? Exactly. It cannot be negative, it has to be zero. So it cannot be negative because we have P square and Q square and they are real numbers. So then the minimal energy is zero. So in classical physics, the minimal energy so the, the energy of the ground state of the oscillator is found uh, to be zero. And it happens when the oscillator is at equilibrium, so at Q equals zero, and without any speed, P equals zero, okay? This is allowed. However, the quantum ground state energy, it's equal to the this minimal, sorry, this, uh, en for n equals zero okay and that's not zero that's h bar omega over two which is actually larger than zero so this is very interesting because it's essentially telling you that you cannot bring the oscillator to a halt you cannot bring the oscillator to a point in which it has no energy and the interpretation is very interesting, and this is why I want to uh, talk about it. So the interpretation is like this. So let me just rewrite the Hamiltonian in a funny way. So the Hamiltonian, we have seen that it's a x squared plus p squared okay but if we so if i ask for the expectation value of the hamiltonian i get the expectation value of x squared and the expectation value of p squared you know already from the exercise and from the last lesson that the expectation value of x squared minus the expectation value of x squared that's something that we call the variance which means that we can rewrite the Hamiltonian in this very nice and simple way in terms of, uh, let's say, statistical observables. The variance of x, the variance of p, and then the expectation value of x squared and the expectation value of p squared. Now, these quantities here, um they are minimized when they are zero because they have a square and they have a positive sign so then you would like x and p to be zero that's a minimal ground state now vx and vp again they are variances they have to be positives and they have positive signs so again you would like them to be zero that's the ground state however you have a constraint so Uh, you have a constraint, which is the uncertainty principle. And the uncertainty principle, with the normalization of positional momentum that we have taken, it's this thing here. So you have that the variance of position times the variance of momentum, quadratures, they are, it's lower bounded by the, by, by one. 
okay? This means that now the uh, energy cannot be minimized by taking Vx equals zero, for example, because then Vp has to be infinity, so that zero times infinity is equal to one, okay? And then you will have an energy that it's infinity, so that's not good. So then H is minimized by taking the expectation values equal to zero, that's fine. But the variances can only be one at best. Let's say that the minimal product of Vx with Vp is one, and the minimal sum is also one. And therefore, um, so this thing here, it's the minimal value that they can get, and we call them zero point fluctuations okay what does this mean if we call them zero point fluctuations for something very simple for a very simple reason it's just that these are the uncertainties in positional momentum this means that when you make a, a, a measurement of position of the position of the oscillator when it is in the ground state, so in the minimal energy, uh, you will not find zero. You will find statistics spread around zero. So in a in a single experiment, maybe you find the oscillator in in position something or minus something, not in position zero. And the same with the momentum. So this is just telling you that the uncertainty principle doesn't allow the oscillator to be still in the equilibrium position it has to always have some kind of uh, fluctuations of random motion and this random motion we call them zero point fluctuations vacuum fluctuations quantum fluctuations but they they are fluctuations of some kind of quantum origin that you cannot find in classical mechanics uh, and they really they, they really come just from uh, the commutation relations and from the uh, all this probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. So then this thing here is compatible and actually implies that the ground state is the the vacuum state of the oscillator. And in other words, the uncertainty principle or the uncertainty relations. So the commutators, they imply that the uh, ground state energy is larger than zero. So there is no, no absolute uh, stillness of an oscillator in quantum mechanics. Okay, so we are getting towards the end of what I want to explain you for today. So maybe just a, a couple of final remarks. So the first final remark is that, so we have talked about the Hilbert space of the harmonic oscillator. So we know that it's infinite dimensional now. So it's just a standard infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, we know that uh, we can find a basis of this Hilbert space with the spectrum of the number operator of the Hamil or the Hamiltonian. But uh, we haven't talked about the quadratures, so the spectrum of the quadratures, the eigenstates of the quadratures, but it's very easy to show that the quadratures, so position and momentum, they have a purely continuous uh, spectrum. So in particular, we already talked about uh, continuous spectrum in uh, in the introduction to quantum mechanics but now you see two specific operators in a specific system so the harmonic oscillator that have a continuous spectrum position and momentum so in particular this means that we can write the position operator the position quadrature we can write it uh, in this way with some eigenstates x that satisfy um, Dirac delta normalization 
n with x real values any real value and the same with the momentum so the momentum operator we can also write it in terms of its eigenstates in this way and they are also all the possible reals um just a note um it's a bit stupid to call all eigenstates of all operators just with a cat related to a label because for example if i give you this if i tell you two what does that mean am i saying position equal to two am i saying momentum equal to two am i saying uh the fox state number two okay but of course from the context you will always be able to know what uh what i'm talking about so whenever i use the label x we will be talking about position p about momentum and n or m uh, about um about the fog states okay but if we need to distinguish or there is any doubt at any point you can always ask um we are going to prove this so because the proof is very simple and i'm not sure if you have seen it um explicitly i mean for sure you have seen it uh, implicitly in many calculations but the proof is just very simple defining so we are going to prove it for the uh, position operator but the same can be done for the momentum operator so let me define an operator that is a unitary operator that we will call the translation translation operator that is simply the exponential of minus i over 2 some real number y and the momentum operator p uh, so as i said y is just any real number and this is important any real number okay then uh, we can easily show that the application of this uh, operator, this translation operator, onto the position operator, the position quadrature. This is equal, and uh, I um, I suggest that you prove it by yourself using the following lemma. So this is something that can be proven in algebra, that is called the Baker. Uh, Campbell, Baker, Hausdorff, or any combination of them theorem that simply says that the exponential of b times a times exponential of minus b, this is always equal. So you can expand in series the exponentials and you can reorder them such that you always get uh, at all orders something like this. So you have the n fold commutator of b with a and just one divider n factorial. So it's kind of like an, an expansion of the exponential function, okay? But uh, using this kind of commutators instead of, of just b to the n, okay? So this nested we call them nested commutators. So then using this formula here is completely trivial. So please do it to show that the translation operator, it simply shifts or translates the position operator. So the application of this operator onto X, it, it generates X plus Y, okay? Then this is very interesting because if we apply this expression, to the eigenstates of the position. So just as we did with uh, the commutation relations of the annihilation and creation operators and so on, uh, with the number with the number operator, if we apply this expression, this expression here, onto the eigenstates of the position operator, what we get is something very nice. It's simply that the translated state so the translation operator acting on the eigenstate x, that's equal to x plus y, where x is the eigenvalue of, 
So this x is the eigenvalue associated to eigenvector x and y is just a translation. And this is times the same vector. Okay. So in other words, just like we did before, the vector ty x is an eigenvector of x, okay, with x plus y eigenvalue. Okay, however, and this is the final point, the final remark, let me maybe make this smaller so you have it out of the way. So this automatically implies that since y is an arbitrary real number, then the eigenvalues are an arbitrary uh, an arbitrary real number as well okay so in other words if i give you an eigenvalue with some eigenvector x sorry an eigenvector with some eigenvalue x you can build any other real number as an eigenvalue just applying the translation operator so this proves that the whole real line are eigenvalues uh, of the position operator and you can do the same with the momentum operator just replacing here the position operator with the momentum operator and proceeding in the same way with the momentum operator in here okay so then uh, finally in the last five minutes that we have i still owe you this proof i have to prove that the vacuum state the ground state is normalizable and now with now that we have defined the eigenstates of the position operator we can do this in the following way so first of all you will need a couple more properties So a couple more properties that please read it right by yourself. You, got, you can find the proofs in the notes, but please do them uh, so you get familiar with how to handle um, all this kind of algebra. And the first property is very simple, is that uh, the, the um, inner product between a momentum eigenstate and a position eigenstate if you want the representation of the momentum eigenstates in the position basis that's equal to just a, an exponential factor xp so a phase factor xp over two and second you can also prove the celebrated result that you are taught about even before they explain you real quantum mechanics with ket notation and so on, which is that the momentum operator acting on any vector psi, that's uh, the representation of that on the position eigenbasis that's equal to minus 2i and the derivative uh, on positions of the representation of the vector itself and um, this representation of the vector itself you know it as uh, what we defined as the continuous representation psi x oops sorry uh, which in the context of position eigenstates we call them we call this a continuous rep representation wave function okay so using these properties these two properties now i will show you so i will prove to you so the proof of that we can normalize the the, the ground state of the oscillator uh, so when i write zero again i have to be careful to make sure that you understand that i'm not talking about a uh, 
eigenstates of position or momentum, this zero refers to the eigenstates of the number operator, which are annihilated by the vacuum state. So using this notation, okay, we can find very easily the following. So first of all, so let's find the um, the position representation, so the wave function of the ground state, which means the inner product of the ground state of the oscillator with the position eigenstates. And this is very simple to find because I can do the following. I can take my uh, my expression that a acting onto vacuum is equal to zero. I can project in project it onto the uh, position eigenstates. But now I simply write my annihilation operator in terms of my creation, uh, sorry, on, of my position and momentum quadratures. So, oops. I get this expression here. Okay, but on the other hand, we also know that uh, x acting on x, that's simply the uh, position uh, eigenvalue x, and that p acting on vacuum represented on x is just the derivative as we can use in here. So then essentially, this expression here is equal to one half of uh x plus two times the derivative on x of the wave function of the ground state and this automatically implies you can solve this differential equation trivially that psi zero of x is equal to some normalization factor and minus x squared to the four okay so now we know the ground state of the oscillator represented in the position basis. So now we can find the corresponding inner product in the following way. So we know that the position eigenstates form a, re a resolution of the identity. So in particular, we know this property here. So we know that this thing here is just the identity operator because um, the sum of projectors of eigenstates of a self-adjoint operator, it's equal to the identity, no matter whether it's a continuous spectrum or a discrete spectrum. And therefore, uh, this expression here, so the, the inner product of the vacuum state with itself, we can find it also just by doing the integration of psi zero x square. But you know how to make the integration of this Gaussian function is completely trivial, right? So it's equal to the square root of two pi, which means that we can set to one the inner product so the norm of zero, if we, of the vacuum state, if we uh, choose the normalization constant n to be the uh, one over two pi uh, to one four, okay? So this shows that we can normalize the ground state of the oscillator. So all these things together, uh, they have proven that the Hilbert space of a harmonic oscillator is just an infinite dimensional Hilbert space that we can construct a basis with the focal or number states that we can run through their spectrum uh, with annihilation and creation operators, that position and momentum have a continuous spectrum, and we can use their basis to do representations such as a wave function. So I hope that all this is a reminder, but we are going to make use of this all the course, all the time. So it's very important that you know it, and this is why I wanted to kind of waste uh, one full lecture on doing this very slowly, 
so you can uh, remember it. And, um, and if you have any questions, please go to the lecture notes, read it carefully. The lecture notes are very detailed. And uh, I also will be very happy if you ask me any questions. So, okay, uh, this is the end of the class. So goodbye to everyone and thank you very much.